Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Ricardo. I'm one of the GG Coimbra's organizers. And today, we're here with Sagar Das. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, he's going to talk with us about integrating Gemini, the new Google AI, with our Android apps. So over to you, Saga. All right. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Ricardo. So uh, let me share my screen and we can get started. Um, just give me a moment. All righty, uh, I think this works. All right, so we're gonna switch between the PowerPoint slides and the Android Studio throughout this uh, presentation. Um, and then we'll probably use the browser window for some time as well. But yeah, let's get started. Uh, welcome folks, uh, my name is Sagar and thank you for joining today's session. This session is actually in partnership with Google Developer Groups. Uh, and Google's very own Build with AI event. Google is right now promoting all of their Gemini APIs and Gemini uh, suite of products, whether it is mobile development or cloud development, and all of those development is coming under one banner known as Build with AI. So first things first, what makes me qualified to talk about this project? Uh, as I said, my name is Sagar. I'm a staff Android engineer working at Vivin Smart Home. Uh, I currently live in Boston. I have been building Android apps for more than 10 years now. Uh, I'm a Google developer expert for Android, and I'm also a GDG organizer for uh, the Boston group. So yeah, and let's kickstart with the most common question which I have been asked in the last two years by my community members. So Boston is a unique city where we have got 35 universities and we have got hundreds of students. So people who are very early, uh, early in their technical career, they always ask me this question, will AI replace Android developers? Um, very interesting question. Uh, in order to understand this concern amongst the minds of students, we need to take a look at history. So in the early 20th century or the late 19th century, when the industrial revolution was happening in all over the world, factories and machines were taking over these jobs, people also had the same concern. Will machine take over humans? Well, as it turned out, they did not. Uh, but rather, the human beings or the workforce learned these new skills in order to how to operate these machines and then worked at factories and then upgraded the skills in order to stay relevant in the workforce. We, are, we as technical developers or software engineers are also going through the same phase where this new AI technology is seemingly taking over every aspect of development, documentation, uh, design, and all of those stuff. There are definitely limitations which we are discovering, but the crucial thing which we are understanding right now is we need to upskill ourselves. We need to start treating AI as an assistant, but not as a replacement. So uh, we are doing, all of us are in this uh, big, uh, the beginning of the phase of this AI revolution where you would find very few people uh, with the actual uh, skill set of navigating through the uh, nuances or the challenges offered by this uh, unique landscape. Now, um, something to keep in mind, like before the advent of generative AI, predictive and analytic AI, uh, analytical AI was also present in the world. So it was in terms of like um, using Google Maps, uh, which used to predict the least amount of traffic that would be uh, that would be encountered by a driver when traveling from a source to destination. Starting from November 2022, with the advent of ChatGPT, generative AI became, uh, started becoming more popular. And right now, um, it is accelerating research in almost every field out there. Um, one of the key industries which is embracing generative AI in their 
uh, research is biology and healthcare. Uh, my wife is a data scientist who works for the healthcare industry, so she always keeps on talking how much, you know, it's very fascinating how fast generative AI is being adopted across all of these uh, healthcare industries. Um, <clears throat> as I said, ChatGPT was launched back in November 2022, but uh, in order to level up the competition, Google released their version of generative AI called Gemini in last year, Google I.O., which was uh, 2023. And then ever since they have been releasing and upgrading new set of libraries and APIs, which can be integrated with Android apps, iOS, web apps, and all of those things. So ultimately uh, they are building all of these generative AI suite or this Gemini API suite with the ultimate vision of bringing people together and then achieving their uh, full potential. So uh, we talked about upscaling in the beginning of the talk. So what is the next big skill to build as a software engineer? The answer is prompt engineering. So what is prompt engineering now? It's actually the practice of creating those text instructions which you will be using in order to interact with the generative AI model. At the end of the day, it's just like a chat bot. Um, and then you need to be aware of certain rules of communication in order to interact with that particular chat bot or in technical terms, we call the generative AI model in order to get the answers in the way how you are expecting it without the model hallucinating or providing you wrong answers. So the technical term for uh, crafting those instructions or those text-based uh, text questions and answers is called prompt engineering. So under the hood, any, every uh, generative AI model, whether be it Gemini or ChatGPT, they have something called as LLM, which stands for large language model. So in short, a large language model takes a set of uh, text-based instructions, um, uh, or, or, uh, or it can be multimodal as well. Like if you can, uh, if you are providing an image as an input, it would be taking pixel by pixel as uh, input. And if it is a sentence, it would be taking word by word as input. And then it would be predicting the most likely next word in that particular sentence. And that is how it works under the hood. So well, this, this was a very simple way of explaining what LLM was. Um, if, you, if you want to learn more about how an LLM functions, you can definitely Google about it. Um, so LLMs are mostly known for their knowledge generation and reasoning. And that's why you would find all of the use cases of LLM, uh, LLMs focused around uh, text analysis or summarizing text or uh, taking an input image and then understanding the context out of it and all of those things. So for example, uh, these days Gemini is also providing the capability of generating images from a text. Now, if you want to try out Gemini, all you have to do is just visit the web version and it's gemini.google.com. And that's it, like you would be finding the chat-based uh, chat uh, interface ready for you to use. Now, um, so we talked about uh, prompt engineering. So a prompt design is both art and science in order to figuring out how exactly you want to interact with a uh, AI model. Um, each prompt is unique. Every prompt, prompt engineer out there has their own engineering technique in order to leverage the power of a generative AI and generate the answers that we are expecting. So at the very core of prompt engineering, there are prompts which are those technical instructions uh, that allow LLM to enforce those rules, automate process, and ensure specific qualities of the generated output or the answer. So what are some of the guidelines for prompt engineering? Well, uh, whenever you are interacting with Gemini or any other Gen AI tool, always make sure to make uh, your question clear, uh, make your question contain clear and specific goals, uh, add a context to it, for example, if you are asking questions, how to develop a front-end application uh, from scratch, adding a little bit more context, like 
uh, I want to build an Android front-end application or an iOS front-end application definitely helps the Gemini or the Gem AI model. Uh, it has to be a, a task-oriented approach, meaning you are giving them a clear, specific problem to be solved. For example, you are asking Gemini to take a paragraph and then summarize the output. So that is a very task-oriented approach, the task being summarizing. And then it always helps on providing examples and references. For example, you already have a long paragraph and a short summary. So you provide that example to Gemini and then you provide a new paragraph. And you ask Gemini, like, can you summarize this new paragraph in the same way that you summarize this previous paragraph? And then last is iteration, meaning that you keep on building level by level. So let's say your Gemini uh, answers a set of lines in the first round. You ask it to iterate over it and then refine the results and then improve the answers and so forth. So you continue doing it until you find the necessary uh, response which you have been looking for. So these are certain examples of prompts. Uh, I added this for just for the sake of information. Um, there are like different types of uh, prompt techniques as well, which you can be using. Those are like prompt engineering techniques. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can uh, Google uh, Google it. But there are the three popular ones are like zero shot prompt, one shot prompt, few shot prompts, and there are uh, there are other techniques like prompt uh, chaining and all of those things. Now, here's a quick look into how Google has been pioneering AI advances in the last 10 years. So they started from 2017 with, uh, in, uh, with uh, creating Transformers. In 2018, they launched BERT, which was used mostly for like creating uh, chatbots and also like voice recognition and then conversational user interfaces. And then they eventually released uh, GPT, upon which ChatGPT built their own tool. And then fast forward to 2023, they have been using Palm and other models to create uh, Gemini. Uh, so we just took a look at gemini.google.com. So I would highly encourage everyone to take a look at if you haven't do done so already. Now, uh, very interesting junction in our talk. So why does AI and Android development matters? Well, uh, AI right now is revolutionizing every single field out there and then Android is no other uh, uh, exception. So AI powered code can help us to identify our errors in Android app development and remove performance bottlenecks. They can also improve user experiences if you want to improve the accessibility of your Android app or improve the design layout or provide like certain uh, AI related features to your users, which would be improving their quality of life. AI is here to help. Now, uh, I included all of these slides because uh, I do not have any idea like how much exposure your community has to Android app development in general or about Android. Uh, and I like to keep uh, certain basic knowledge stuff in my slides. so. These are like some really basic slides which we'll be covering before we get to the actual hands-on stuff. So uh, for anyone who is not aware, Android is the most popular mobile operating system uh, out there in the world. Now, I'm originally from India, but right now I live in the US. Well, in United States, Apple and iOS is more popular, but then outside of US, the entire world is dominated by Android. Main reason being it's a it's an open source operating system. It runs on Linux, and then it has a huge community support in Europe, Asia, and Africa, and other parts of the world. So, when it comes to Android app uh, development, any Android app out there can be divided into four different components: an activity, a service, a content provider, and a broadcast receiver. For the purposes of this talk, we will just be focusing on activity, learning about like different components of Android app uh, is out of scope for this talk. So an activity is a fundamental unit of any user interaction of an Android app, or you can call it, it's, it's just a screen. So for example, you have your music app and you launch it and you see a list of songs being listed. So this entire screen is an activity. 
Another example would be if you launch your email app and you click on a compose uh, email button, and then you see uh, the page or the screen where you are, uh, where you can write your email. That particular screen is also known as an activity. Now, uh, which ID do we use for Android app development? We call it as Android Studio. Something to keep in mind is Android Studio has uh, three different flavors associated with it, stable, beta, and uh, canary. Now, this is the URL for downloading Android Studio ID. If you check it out over here. Yep, so this is a stable version. Now, if you go to the preview tab, you would be finding the canary, uh, the canary bird, which has all of the latest features that Google has been trying out, but has not been tested enough to move it to the stable uh, release. So for the purposes of this talk, we would be using the canary build of uh, Android Studio. So I have already installed Android Studio Canary over here, or we called it Android Studio Preview, which we'll be using in a second in order to start leveraging Gemini APIs. Now, the official language which we use for Android app development is Kotlin. Previously, it was Java, but in 2017 or 18, um, Google had a very big dispute with uh, Oracle in order for gaining license for Java or something, but, uh, and then something happened and then things took a turn for the uh, better. And then we started using Kotlin. Well, Kotlin is 100% intercompatible and interoperable with uh, Java. It reduces a tons of boilerplate code and the entire Android community has been using Kotlin for the last six to seven years now with no complaints. Uh, a lot of development is also happening for Kotlin. We have got Lao uh, Kotlin multi-platform support and all of those things. So it's it's a really good language. Now let's move on to the hands-on part. All right. So the very first thing which we need to do before integrating a Gemini API within our Android app is to visit uh, this URL, which is aistudio.google.com slash app and slash API key. If I copy this URL and paste it on the web browser, let's see what do we get. All right, so essentially you would be logging in your Gmail account and then you click on create API key and then you would be adding certain details about your projects and it will be generating an API key over here. I have already generated for my project uh, uh, so you guys can feel free to generate an API key in AI Studio, and then we'll be using that API key later in our project uh, in order to get started with AI capabilities. So let's go to the next slide. All right. Now, in order to create an app which is integrated with Gemini API, Android Studio Preview has done it much uh, in, in, has done it in a much easier way. So all we have to do is go to file and go to new. And when you click on new project and you will be seeing over here, a template called Gemini API starter. Keep in mind that this particular feature is not available in Android Studio uh, stable version. It is only available for Android Studio preview now. So when you click on next, you give an application name and then you select uh, the minimum of SDK, which is the minimum version of Android that your app can be supported for. The default is Android 7.0. Um, you can change it as per your wish. And when you click on next, this is where you would be adding your API key, which you generated just now for from the Google AI Studio. It would be just like a, any regular sequence of API key uh, characters like a bunch of 25 or 230 characters, random alphanumeric sequence with no sense. Uh, and that is how we'll be providing. So for simplicity's sake, I have already created my project, uh, but once you add your API key, you would be seeing the next button and the finish button being enabled over here. And once you click on that, your project would be created. So I have already created my project over here. Let's 
quickly come back to the slide and let's see what do we need to discuss next. Okay, so we provide the project details and an API key. And then once we do that, we click on the project and it gets completed. All right, now let's take a look at the project structure that we have. So for anyone who is not aware of the standard Android structure, I can give a quick primer. So an Android project is divided into two major folders in the Android view. So the first is the app folder, and then the second is Gradle scripts. So Gradle scripts are nothing but the actual build system. They, uh, they take as input as all the Kotlin files and the Java files, and then they package all of the bytecode generated from the Kotlin and Java files into APK bundles. And that APK bundle is something that can be uploaded to Play Store or directly installed in our Android device. And that APK bundle is essentially what we call it as app. Now, in order to see what all dependencies your app is using, you can open, uh, the first thing which you can open is the libs version stored TOML file, or we call it as the version catalog. So the version catalog gives you the list of libraries which your Android app is using. I think I need to increase the font size a bit so that it becomes easier to see. Uh, okay. All right. Now, if you notice over here, the library which we are interested in the most is the generative AI. So if I do a command C and command F, and let's see what is the library name. So yeah, this is the actual library which gets added if we are using the Gemini AI. Uh, template. There are other libraries as well, uh, Compose and everything. Anyone who is curious what is Compose, so Compose is the new declarative way of building UI for Android apps. Previously, we used to build AI using XML. Right now, we are doing using Kotlin, and Compose is the declarative framework which we are using. Now, uh, so we verified like we have the library for generative AI. AI. Now we need to go into the Gradle file for the actual app and then verify whether that dependency has already been included. So I see over here there is an implementation libs generative AI. So that means that the library has already been imported. Now, in order to understand the structure of any Android app project, let's take a look at the different folders that we have under the app folder. So we have got manifest, which is nothing but, it, it's kind of like a configuration of the different components for your Android app. So in one of the slides, we talked about the different components, which are activities, service, uh, service provider, broadcast receiver, and all of those things. So over here, you see something called as activity, and then it says main activity, which is nothing but the main screen or the starting point of your app when it gets launched. Now, when you expand Kotlin plus Java folder, you would be finding multiple folders uh, out of which two of those are test folders, unit test, UI test, instrumentation test. We will not be covering those in this talk, but the other folder is the place where it contains the actual coding files which power your uh, app. Now, over here, you would be seeing something called as the theme folder which is pretty simple. It has all of the colors that is being used. And then the theme is actually bundling all of these individual colors into these wrapper objects, which can be used by your UI components. And then we have a type file, which is nothing but the typography, the actual fonts, which is being used. And then we have the activity, which is a screen. Now, if you take a look over here in the code, it is calling the baking screen. Now, the shortcut for navigating to any component within an IntelliJ IDEA is Command B if you're on Mac or Control B if you're on Windows. And once you do that, it will take you to the baking screen. Now, this baking screen is another file over here, which is also a Kotlin file, and you will be seeing it annotated with the word composable, which lets us know that we are using Jetpack Compose under the hood. Now, uh, here's, uh, here's one of the things which a lot of uh, 
entry level android devs ask me like if someone is new to an app how do we figure out where to navigate or find the actual important pieces of the information so in order to do that let's first run this app and let's see what sort of sample app has been created by google by default so if i want to run so i click this run button over here and then over here you would be seeing the list of devices which is attached to your computer so i'm using a google pixel 8 but if you don't have an actual android device with you you can create an emulator so in order to create an emulator you go to device manager and then you click on this plus button you create a virtual device and then you will be seeing a bunch of options for creating this virtual device since i'm already using a real device uh i can go ahead and click on the run button once i do that let's go to this running devices window and we'll wait for my phone to show up uh, in this particular window so the app has been launched it says installed successfully for some reason it is not being showed over here so let's do this yeah click on the plus button this is a pixel eight yep there we go all right so this is the default uh, app which is built by the sample template i have not done any changes it is what google has been providing out of the box for anyone to get started with uh, gemini apis now let's see what do we have over here so in the sample app we have a bunch of images and all of those looks really good like they have got cookies and breads and pastries and all of those things and then you see a prompt over here which is nothing but a text box with a pre-generated content that says provide a recipe for the baked goods in the image so i'm curious what happens when i click on go so it gets connected with the internet and then let's wait for the app to do its magic there we go and just like that it generates the recipe for the stuff which is seen in the image so it says all of the ingredients required the also the instructions in a step-by-step -step format which is lovely now as an android developer uh, as i said like a lot of entry-level people uh, find a difficulty in order to navigate within the app for example, I'm curious where to find this code written for this button or what is the code written for the widgets. So one of my favorite ways is to use a tool called as Layout Inspector. Now, in order to use the Layout Inspector, all you have to do is launch your app first. Now, our app is already launched. So we click on this button over here, which says Toggle Layout Inspector. We click on that. And let me minimize certain things in order to get a better view. So let's wait for this layout inspector tool to load up first. There we go. And now you would be seeing all of these individual UI components being uh, surrounded by these bounding boxes. So let's do this. Let's. We are close all of these files from here. Okay. Now I'm interested in finding out where what is the code for this go button. So I click on this. Uh, so there would be an interaction button as well, which helps me to find out toggle deep inspect. Yeah, there we go. So you need to toggle deep inspect first. So once you toggle it, you would be seeing things highlighted over here. Now, if I click on this button first over here, it shows me uh, all of the details associated with it. And it also shows me the file in which it has been uh, written. So I click on this and over here, it takes me to the exact spot of the file where the code for the button is created. So we are inside baking screen now and you can see there's a button and then you can see there's a text for the button which says go and then there is an option called as on click so as an engineer and we are talking about all of these gemini apis i'm curious how this actual call is being sent 
So all we need to do is go inside the send prompt button. So I already told the shortcut is command B for Mac. If I do that, it takes me inside baking view model. Now inside baking view model, they have a send prompt uh, command, which uh, launches a coroutine scope. We'll be discussing what a coroutine scope is in a moment. So over here, the actual code is very simple. So all we have to do is over here, they are leveraging the generative model. If you take a look at the generative model over here, this is the variable which is being defined and the generative model is being created from the generative AI library. And you can also set the model name very soon. Like for now, they are using Gemini Pro Vision, but as and when Google comes up with different models, we can use different model names as well. And then we have got the API key. So over here, if you go to the build config API key, you would be seeing your sequence of characters. Now using generative a, a generative model, we are sending both the image and the text, which we entered in the prompt window. And in order to uh, send the request, all we are doing is generate content. And then we are getting the response over here. And then we are showing the response in another text view, which is very simple. Now, but there are certain key things which certain uh, Android devs might be wondering if someone is especially new to the world of Android development. And those are, we talked about a bunch of terms over here, view model and all of those things. So let's take a quick look on the refresher of those, what actually a view model is. So there are certain popular architecture uh, patterns which we follow when it comes to Android app development or software development in general. The most popular one, which was, uh, used most frequently in the early 2000s was MVC, model view controller. From 2010 to 15, people started using MVP, model view presenter. And then post 2015, most of the Android projects have been pointed towards MVVM and that's model view view model. So what does those terms exactly mean? Now, in a quick refresher, I can say model is any portion of the code which actually stores the data. View is the portion which displays the data. And view model is the piece of the code which handles user input and manages the data. Or in other terms, you can say it processes the business logic. Now, over here in our code, you can see, so we do not have a model over here because this is a very simple app. But for example, uh, you want to save the responses generated by generative AI uh, to a database or to, an, to a file and all of those things, all of that code would be considered model. But over here, we have got a view model file, which deals with the business logic. Over here, we are making the call to Gemini API, and then we are getting the response. And then we have got a baking screen, which is the actual view part, which is nothing but the actual UI components built in Compose. Uh, we have got the standard layout uh, of any uh, Android screen. So we've got a column, we've got images, we've got text fields, and we have got a button. Now, uh, coming back to, yes. Now, before we move to, so we, we we saw the view model and then we saw an interesting thing which says view model scope. And I said like, this is a coroutine block. So before I start explaining about uh, coroutines very quickly, let's check out the other capabilities of the app. So um, let's see. So I do not need the layout inspector anymore. Now, instead of using this images, let me go ahead and ask any other question. So for example, I wanna ask how many continents are there in the world? I click on go. While it's generating the response. All right, there we go, perfect. And now let's see if it is capable of summarizing text or not. Let's go ahead and find any text with a long paragraph. So I'll just do uh, text with a long 
paragraph and i'll just grab any other text from google so uh yeah okay so this maybe or oh, yeah there we go random paragraph generator thousands of something something let's generate something and let's copy this or let me copy this generating random paragraphs and everything after i copy this paragraph paste it over here and then in one of the earlier slides we talked about prompt engineering techniques so let me provide a task for my action that needs to be executed by the generative AI. so i will be saying summarize the below paragraph in maybe two lines And then let's use the go button. Yeah, I guess there might be a bug in this app which does not allow the UI to refresh if this particular window is too large. Yeah, the app crashed. That is something good to know. But let me reduce the length of the paragraph, for example. Summarize the below paragraph. And then from the internet, maybe I'll take, I'll just take four lines. Okay, this should work. Now I'll click on go. Okay. And does it have two lines? Yes, it has two lines. So this is the first line and this is the second line. Okay, so these are the very, uh, the two core fundamental powers of generative AI, which is available for Android right now, if you are using Gemini API. So number one being text summarization or text generation. And the second one being uh, multimodal analysis or the image analysis. So for image analysis, this were, um, earlier, we saw the example of generating a recipe from all of these uh, cake images and then pastries or donut images. And then this is an example of uh, text summary. So these are the limitations for now. Maybe in future, like uh, by the end of this year, uh, Google might uh, roll out another a third feature to Gemini API and that would be image generation. Because right now, if you go to gemini.google.com, you can generate images. But for now, when it comes to Gemini API for Android, you can only analyze images. So hopefully very soon. All right, now that we have talked about the features, let's talk about the coroutine scope, which we saw earlier. Now, when we go to, yeah. So in order to understand what a coroutine scope is, we need to first understand what are the different types of operations uh, we deal with in the world of software engineering. So the first one is we call as synchronous operation. So what it means is when you execute those operations, it blocks the main thread until they are finished. So it's exactly like you do task one and then only after that you do task two. There is no way how you can do tasks in parallel. So a solution to that would be performing asynchronous operation. So what does that mean is asynchronous operations do not block the main thread. They do stuff mostly on parallel or they let the main thread know once a particular task has been done, maybe in sort of like callback and using a timer and all of those things. And something to keep in mind is both sync and async operations leverage only one thread. On the other side of the spectrum, we have got multi-threading, which means we are using multiple threads in order to perform parallel uh, executions. But the caveat or the drawback is you would be using those uh, multiple uh, hardware cores or the CPU cores. So it comes with the caveat of using more battery life and then CPU resources. And sometimes it's just an overkill. 
So in the world of Android, uh, ever since we started using uh, Kotlin, most of the uh, developers and have switched to Coritans. And that is something Google has already been recommending to every Android developer out there to start using Coritans and avoid multi-threading whenever they can. Uh, because there are certain pitfalls or disadvantages when it comes to multi-threading. So as I said, like those are expensive uh, because you would be using uh, individual CPU cores and those CPU cores would be using up uh, your device battery life. Threads are definitely limited on any device. Um, they are also very much platform dependent, like Java would be having its own way of creating threads. And then uh, your individual Android device manufacturer creates their custom version of Android. So they would be adding their own threading logic and all of those things. So in order to avoid uh, threading logic, we use Coroutines, which um, it's, it's an async way of uh, performing certain operations uh, in order to achieve parallel tasks, such as um, uh, without blocking the main thread, for example, making the network calls or uh, decoding bitmap images and all of those things. So essentially, when you uh, see, when, when you want to use a coroutine block or a coroutine scope, there are certain signs which you can look for in order to say whether it is uh, utilizing a coroutine blocks or not. So the first thing is a scope. Uh, anytime that you see a scope dot launch, uh, definitely it's a coroutine block. And then there are certain things like dispatches. Dispatches help uh, it to uh, decide the coroutines need to run on which particular thread. So we have got the IO thread, we have got the main thread, and there is, a, I guess, what is the third one? So we have got IO, main, and we have got the default, yeah. So they have also added an unconfined as well, which is cool. Uh, yeah. So the dispatches allow the coroutines to decide on which thread to execute. And then uh, within that, you can use any standard format of coding. Like for example, we have the try catch block over here. We are making the URL request uh, and then we are getting the response and all of those things. Now, uh, so that was pretty much it when it comes to using Gemini API, as it said, uh, as I said, like it is very simple to get started. All we need to do is generate an API key and then use the starter template for Android Studio Preview. And that said, you can get started. Now let's wrap up the talk by talking about how generative AI has been transforming all of the different pieces of tech that we are uh, using. So it's more of like what I started uh, saying in the beginning of this talk, like it has been rapidly being adopted in different industry segments, healthcare, financial services, uh, smart home technologies. So I said, I work for Women Smart Home, which is a smart home IoT space. We have got different doorbell cameras, garage door logs. So one of the use cases which smart home industry is looking into uh, using Gemini APIs or generative AI APIs is, for example, so if we consider the sample app, you have images of uh, cakes and pastries. But if you are using a smart home app, you would be seeing images of people standing in front of your doorstep and your doorbell camera would be taking a picture. So you can ask your generative AI chatbot, like, who is it? Or you can just build an app which would be running a background service and it will be generating a notification saying that it's your, it's your husband at your door or it's your wife at your door, or they would be saying like there are two dogs in front of your door and all of those actual contexts, like uh, the, the, trash, uh, the trash truck came up for picking up the trash, uh, did your kids water your garden or not, and all of those things. The possibilities and the use cases are limitless. So it is being used uh, rapidly across uh, entertainment industry as well, the communication industry and all of those things. So uh, something which most of the organizations are spending their energy right now is to figure out which sort of roles and businesses would be useful when it comes to using Gen AI. Uh, there are different ways how this is predicted to be helping out 
most of the developers out there, including me, have started using generative AI to get assistance for code, like fixing errors, generating unit test cases. Um, a lot of customer service team has also started using generative AI in order to answer questions from uh, different people about their products, uh, generating images and videos, and getting feedback on the design for UX designers and all of those things. So as I said, like most of the engineering leaders or business leaders are trying to find out um, what sort of opportunities can be unlocked when it comes to using generative AI, whether it can be um, in terms of cost savings or value creation. So all of these things are good to be aware as an engineer, as you're building an Android app or any software that uses Gemini API or generative AI in general, in order to understand what sort of value you are bringing into your business. So ultimately when you present your project to uh, your manager or your uh, engineering leader, they need to understand what is the value of generative AI that is being uh, brought into their uh, apps and products. So uh, a few good uh, resources over here. So we have got the official Google Gemini cookbook, which is in GitHub. If we go over here, you will be finding good samples around that. Yeah, a collection of guides and examples for Gemini API. You'll find tons of examples of how to use it in different uh, SDKs and languages. For this talk, we saw Android. Anyone who's interested for Swift and Python, they can go over here. And next thing is, uh, feel free to follow me on Medium. Uh, I write performance engineering and AI blogs. Uh, one of the blogs which I wrote a few months ago was making the Android workforce ready for generative AI. So for if you are someone who is planning to introduce generative AI in your team at work, but you are struggling how to promote it to your manager or to your uh, engineering leader. This particular article helps in providing you a step-by-step -step, uh, action-oriented approach in order to how to select a problem statement, how do you create experiments, how do you share those results, and then how do you promote the usage of generative AI and all of those things. And lastly, you can go to the official uh, developer android.com studio uh, preview Gemini template in order to find out more information on how the Gemini template has been evolving. Oh, I guess they have updated the URL. So in that case, we can do um, Android Gemini. And yeah, so this is the new URL which they are using. So, okay, so this is on the Gemini bot, which is present in the Android Studio feature. So anyone who's curious, so we have got the Gemini bot as well over here, which is different from the Gemini API. Uh, for the Gemini API, just give me a moment. Um, Yeah, they have updated the page somewhere. I guess it would be this one. Yeah, there we go. I guess they have created a Google Code Lab and you know much more detailed than it was a few months ago. So anyone who's interested, let me go ahead and copy and paste this link in the chat. Yeah, so this is the new link. And then Yep, that's about it. Um, feel free to add me on LinkedIn and follow me on Medium. Uh, as I said, like I'm also an organizer for GDG Boston Android. Feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We definitely do like code camps and upload videos over there. So anyone who is interested in learning more about Android development or like compose related development, so we have got good videos in our channel which you can follow along and code along as well. So yeah, uh, that's about it. Thank you. And let's see if we haven't got any questions. All right, I can stop sharing my screen.
All right, so do we have any questions? Yeah, it's definitely tough to uh, include a lot of uh, information into a 40 to 45 minutes talk. But the good thing is Google is doing an excellent job in providing simple examples when it comes to sample app. So just now, like we saw, it's really easy to get started with Gemini API and Android apps in just you know, in 10 minutes. So that is something good. Okay. Uh, so if we do not have any questions, but um, I, I, I do I have know. a question, even though it's a bit of an open uh, answer question. Um, so right now, uh, Gemini is well somewhat limited in to in regard in the sense that we can use it mostly as a chatbot, as you mentioned. Um, do you think that eventually we will get to a point where we can actually use AI to aid users to better use our apps or to better guide them through the app, considering how they interact with it? Absolutely, that's a very good question. That's something which um, the Gemini bot within Android Studio has started doing uh, since like few months ago. So right now when you install Android Studio Preview and you enable Gemini bot within Android Studio, they will be asking you two options. Uh, the first option would be to use context of your project. And the second would be to use no context. Now, if you enable context in your project, Gemini bot would be understanding how your code base is structured and it will be helping you uh, by providing responses and answers uh, when it comes to like, where is the code file, where is the UI component and all of those things. So I definitely feel like what you asked your question, uh, it is definitely doable in the near future, the Gemini API would come with an option for uh, understanding the context of an app so you pro you integrate it with any app and then in the background thread or in a background service gemini would be running and understanding all of these different screens and services and all of the components that you have within the app and then automatically you can be creating a chatbot or a tutorial screen where gemini would be helping the users to figure out where different components of the app are out there so yeah that's something i definitely feel Google would be introducing soon. Thanks. Oh, we have got a question in the chat. How can we translate Kotlin to Java? That's a good question. Um, the short answer is there is no automated tool to translate Kotlin to Java. There are automated tools to translate Java to Kotlin because there are different studies out there which shows Kotlin is much faster than Java when it comes to interacting with the Android runtime. Now the argument might be that as Java is faster than Kotlin, which is true in certain cases if you are solely relying on JVM. But when it comes to Android, uh, it uses Android runtime or ART, A-R-T in short, under the hood and then Kotlin. There are, there are different studies out there. You can just Google in medium and everything which will be showing you the comparative results of running Java code versus Kotlin code. Uh, for now, there are no automated tools. Um, the only way how you can do is like refer the documentation and then convert certain Kotlin related stuff to Java. Something to keep in mind is you might not be finding a direct 100% translation from Kotlin to Java, for example, coroutines. Coroutines is something which is not available in Java out of the box. They have the different methods of achieving something. I think last year they launched something called as light threads or something, which Java 19 claims that it does the same thing as Kotlin coroutines, but there is nothing which is a direct replacement for coroutines uh, in Java. Similarly, there are other Kotlin features which will not be available in Java. Yeah. All right, if there are any other questions, feel free to reach me out on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll do my best to follow up with an answer. And yeah, this was great. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. That's, uh, that's a wrap then. Uh, again, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks, Sagar, for your time and for your talk. 
was really insightful and I hope to see you all again in the next GDG Quimbra event. Cheers.